Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about asteroids um, because they are a great explanation of some of the perturbations we've been seeing in these systems. Um, we're going to look at the distribution of them. And then we're going to go into the three body diagram so that we can understand um, orbiting. Let me just show you this really cool video from uh, Paul Weigert's group at University of. Okay. Yeah. Here's the Earth. And these are all asteroids that start out in the same orbit as us. Okay. And over the course of even a hundred years, you see that thing? Yeah, it all clumping up, right? So we'll want to understand that process. Here's a thousand years. So we let uh, more and more time pass. And in this simulation, each of the planets is pulling. I mean, they're not to scale in size, obviously, but it's visually there, so it's easy for everybody. But 10,000 years, and these are fairly stable. What that means is that these objects are not thrown out of the system. You're keeping a very careful eye on whether some of them have moved. But now what you're noticing, they don't all stay circular. Right? And so by the time that this finishes, we are going to be talking about the difference between stuff that starts off circular and it ends up non-circular. And then when we look at the distribution of asteroids, we would be quite surprised if we saw completely circular orbits, that they're interacting with cell new body and they're so okay. All right. Um talk about this. Do you remember all these? Do you remember all these? It's the same. Uh, think back to what we did last Thursday. Oops. We we're talking about bodies going around one another. We were particularly interested in not having to follow both of them. We're going to make some changes to the system and redefine our units so that we don't have to care about the asteroid counts. Okay. In that case, we use this method, which masses. Yeah, something like the effective mass. It's called the reduced mass. Reduced mass. And here is where you find the center of mass. Right? And you have the center of mass velocity, this speed of the center of mass. And this is the energy of the system. Notice that the energy of the system only considers the reduced mass and the velocity of the system as a whole. And then it talks about the gravitational potential energy in these together, because you said the thing is orbiting, and we know by this partition here that this is just the potential. Okay. Similarly, we found this out last time. 
We understand it. What is the takeaway that we hear? This is what quantity again? Angular momentum, right? And what is the, the weird thing about angular momentum? The counterintuitive result that we talked about last time. Well, you get the faster you go, right? That was the equipartition of velocity and distance. You get closer, R goes down, D has to go up. Conservation of momentum, right? What about if you're comparing different types of orbits? Does anything weird happen when you're thinking about different types of orbits? That's the way it would seem, right? Yeah, but it's not. But it's not. Circular, right? Because the eccentricity shows up right here, right? And it's eccentricity squared. So something like 0.99999, 1 minus 0.999, that's going to be very small. And this kind of makes sense, because we talked about what happens when you have an eccentricity of 1. That is an unbound orbit. Something that comes in, passes by the sun once, and then leaves forever. And so to conserve any momentum, you must have started with nine with respect to this system. Okay, here's some other relationships. These are the ones that you'll need to know. Um, this is a mathematical interpretation of the things we just said. Okay, um, this says d a d t. Which a are we talking about here? Yeah, I would use a little a. Actually, this one is the little a. Why is it the big? Okay, so how do I read this piece first first line? The changing area with respect to sign is equal to next line. Is it a height? So this one here, yeah, you, you're thinking area and you're thinking height, but that's not what H means anymore. Is it still in It is, what kind of angle? Three. Point two. Go back one slide. So this is the angular momentum of the entire system. If I divide by the vertical mass, I get h. And in fact, if I look here, oh, this is what this thing is. This thing without the mu is h. And then there's a two. So now let's interpret what I've said. And you said, David, that this is the time rate of change of what? Oh, with respect to time. Yeah, yeah. Of what quantity of? Oh, area. Area. So this is the time rate of change of the area. And what was h again? Specific angular momentum. 
Does the specific angular momentum change in an orbit? It's the energy, total energy change? No, does the angular momentum change? You should have that same instant. See? It's a conserved quantity. So therefore, H must be a constant. Okay, so now what this says is the rate of change of the area with respect to time is a constant. What law is that? Second law. How do you draw that? Well, you start with any ellipse, right? Assume that that's elliptical. And you say, if I have some unit of time, that creates a triangle here. Then by the time that I look over here and I look at a similar amount of time, these areas must be equal. This is a graphical version of this law. There was this one. I'll write this. That's correct. That was third law. But instead of proportionality, it's equal. So this is what happens when you introduce Newton's law, specifically the law of gravitation. Okay, okay what's this one? Don't see my good track, right? Kepler's <laughs> first law is simply that objects orbit in ellipses with one item total. So we're now moved away. This one you may not have followed this in class. This is the visa v equation. Um, okay, and this just tells you your speed instantaneously at any location in the orbit. And similarly here, um, this is how we define the period in terms of parts per second. Okay. So we talk about the two-body problem versus the three-body problem versus the many-body problem. Two-body problem is we only have to consider two bodies. And we made some simplifications. Use the reduced mass. We try to consider all of these different things in order to make some very um, straightforward assumptions. They're not always easy, but they're straightforward intellectually. They're not like trying to understand special relativity. And the math is hard. Math is hard when it was constructed in the 1700s. And the math for a three body problem gets worse. Because these do not have solutions that are obvious unless you make very specific assumptions. Um, in every two body relationship, you have a one over r squared force. Okay. So any deviation from that perfect inverse square, you no longer get ellipses. So if, for example, I have a force. Right. Let's say the force on my object, uh, you know, stand away wavy here, is proportional to one over r squared. So then Newton knew this already, 
He said, oh, you get ellipsis. But if I add anything, let's say I add this, then what happens? Yeah, it's not going to be an ellipse that stays where it is. So you can get precession and get the orbit to physically move to rotate. And we'll see this and see um, perfections. Okay. Um, so you saw at the very beginning, we saw this like picture of all of these different asteroids that were in the same orbit as the Earth, all going around in a perfect circle. And yet they're getting old. And they have these additional force contributions that are going to change their orbits. Okay. The main issue here is that even though perturbations can be small, because when you work in planetary science and you think about the history of the entire solar system, which has been around for four and a half billion years, a very small force over millions of years can add up and start with it. Because as long as they're in tune, then their force is magnified. Similarly, you can push them on the swing. You just arbitrarily push them if you're a child, right? You never get them going fast. If you learn how to push them on a swing, you have to wait, right? It's back to the same place. You give them that same push, and then you can get them to go all the way around the spin. Okay. You know what you've ever done? All right. When you have small perturbations, you start off with an elliptical orbit that's of course sped up. But you have a small perturbation, you can get the orbit to rotate. You can get the main axis location to change. And here you have something called the, the precession of the perihelion mercury. So this number is how much it's rotating every hundred years. Very little, right? Especially because human beings can be looking at it, right? So you have to be able to make the observations. Now, this contribution, 5,600, right? That's what you have to explain if you're going to be good at any sort of gravity. And the first 5,025 is an artifact of the fact that the coordinate system is precise. But you have to remain the rest of it. This is the one that you have to explain. And if you can explain this, then your version of gravity is the correct one, right? So the first contribution is due to Venus. Venus has the largest one, 280 arc seconds. Jupiter is even pulling. So Jupiter is farther than us, but it's bigger. So you get 150. You get 102 mostly from the Earth, but from other planets as well. And this was the one I was telling you about that they couldn't explain. And they were like, something weird is happening. Mercury. 43 arc seconds. Really, really tiny measurement, okay? And yet it's significant enough for people to realize that there must be additional gravity terms considered near close to that. All right. Um, so we tend to think, you know, we, we talked about the Hamiltonian, and we said create um, equations and motions for R and for eta, for BR and for B eta. That's what we call an integrable solution. Right? Integrable. You can integrate, get a solution. And uh, here you have something very straightforward, right? You have time. Time gives you energy. Similarly, you have the position that gives you the momentum. Okay. Um, you need solutions can be completely obtained for any integrable quantity. So you can predict orbits. Exactly. And okay. goes around and back. Right. Two body problem. As soon as you add one more, just one, you no longer have an analytic solution. You no longer have an 
So the first thing we'll talk about is the restricted free body problem. And the thing that we're going to do when we get to this, not in this class, but in, in Tuesday's class, is to imagine two massive bodies and one body with no mass. Why would you do that? Yeah, you just want to see how the two masses affect the particle, and you don't care about the mass of the two masses. Because if the two masses are affected by the particle, then they start moving. But if you can keep the two masses doing whatever they normally like to do, you know, for example, solve by a completely integrable solution, that's much easier. Because then you just you model those two, and then this one has like a perturbation. Um, we're going to see some unpredictable problems. We're going to see the effects of perturbations, and they're happening at the right time in resonance, and those mean motion resonances that you saw in the homework. And you're also going to see non deterministic solutions. Two solutions that start very similar to one another and yet diverge. So the idea of chaos is a mathematical concept, and it has everything to do with. I didn't bring anything to drop. Okay. All right. Yeah, like system or not? Chaos has to do with whether or not you can predict the outcome. Whether or not two objects that start very similar conditions will follow the same path. Uh, once I hit the table, something might happen. So their initial drop will be non chaotic And then they may diverge. Right? If you quite end up where they're supposed to. So if I do it again, we'll do the same thing. It's like to roll away. I don't know why that is. <laughs> okay, interesting. So this is the idea of chaos. We take two particles, we give them almost the same conditions, and we let them evolve. Do they end up near one? Or do they end up in two different places? In a chaotic system, they will end up in two different places. In a non-chaotic system, they'll end up together. Examples of non-chaotic systems. Yeah, before I drop them, good. Another one. You're stuck together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then that's one part. That's a way. That's a way around with getting one. But what's another? One? Fall on top of the hill, you know where that's going. The rest of the bottom. So with it. Two of the same peppers. They look on chaotic. <laughs> That's pretty much good. Right? Okay, non-chaotic system. That was very different than this, right? Maybe the yellow one is the source of the chaos. So black fluids are very chaotic. Because each of the particles interacts with the rest of the particles bouncing off of it, right? And you get nonlinear phenomena. These particles won't bounce off of each other, they shouldn't. That's not really fun with the math. But in restricted free body problems, you'll see there are forms of chaos. 
I'm sorry, in the free body problems to this point. Okay. So we're going to find non deterministic solutions um, in the course of the next week. All right. A really um, advanced um, simulation of uh, uh, pushing on the swing. And uh, all you have to do is push at the right time. In case no one's ever been outside on the swing. So small perturbations are very important. Right? Think about what this means for the Earth. If the solar system is 4.6 billion years old, how many times has the Earth gone around the sun? For 4.6 billion times, right? That's a lot. What about Venus? That's the right answer for a planetary scientist. More. Good. What about Mars? Oh, no, no, no. Mercury, yeah. Mercury would be a lot more. Mars? How many do you know? Do you know how long Mercury's here? Or Mars is here? And you got it. It was half of this number, right? It's going to be just about twice as long. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. Still billions of orbits, right? So think about how much if you can like give a little bit of a force, right? But it's a billionth of the strength, then it can add up if you do a billion times, right? Okay. So the only thing is they have to add construct. So if they don't add constructively, if sometimes they're positive or sometimes they're negative, sometimes it pushes in, sometimes it pushes out, those will net to zero. Right? Those will average. Okay. So you read about mean motion resonances when you were doing the homework, and you saw the effect of mean motion resonance when we were in the gas section. So now let's have a look at what happens in the asteroid. Okay. So we'll have some definitions first. Um, so let's imagine we have a couple bodies, right? Here's the sun. Oops. And let's have some object that's interior to this. Let's say it's a magnet. Going faster. Going faster. I looked. Looks longer. Okay, so this one goes faster than this. And the major question is if I'm over here every time that Jupiter gets to here. Right, every single time, then I'm going to have a little special pull. Have over here, 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 here. Okay. So we can define something called the mean motion. I don't care if the orbit's elliptical. Right, I'm going to assume that it looks like a circular orbit. And the only thing I care about is an A, semi-major axis. I'll do the word in asteroid. Is that fair? And of course, the M here is our sun, so it's made by the solar system. But if you want to do this for Io or for any of the ringlets, you could also do that. So we're going to make a definition here. All this says object P, one of the two, and object Q, one of the others. So if the amount of time that it takes to go around one is an integer multiple of the other, 
Then you have mean motion resonance. So if this goes around two times, or every time this goes around once, mean motion. If this goes around three times, or every time this goes around twice, mean motion. What's the strongest mean motion resonance? Okay. Similarly, you can write these as periods, right? Because of the things we just wrote in the last one, they're all constant. Is that fair? Um, we write these as IJ, the little colon in between. And you just have to kind of remember what this means. So um, it recurs every J orbits, the second one. And the I orbits are the per perturber. So this is the guy doing the pushing, and this is the one getting pushed. So if I say uh, that system is in a 4 1 resonance, what does that mean? Or let me say this more slowly. Let's say it's in a 4 1 resonance with you. This asteroid. Again. Yeah, remember that I here is tracking with the perturber. That'll be Jupiter. So he goes around, I said, four, one. And J is the one, that's the asteroid. Goes around once every four times. Okay. And fuck that up, that's okay. Okay. It's not as important. Like you'll see the ring. You don't need an exact equality. And you'll see this when you look at the distribution of asteroids. That it's not like everyone's fine except for that exact. But as you get closer, it's kind of like a hill of instability. So if you're off, if you're like a not quite a two to one, but maybe a 2.1 to one, it's still gonna mess you up. Saw that? What's that one again? <laughs> Good reading, yeah. So, in fact, we can think about this in the context of the semi major axis ratio, right? So, here's the semi major axis. So, if you know those and you haven't memorized the periods of the solar system, you can just look for this. And uh, we're going to talk about asteroids that mostly lie between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So, what are the main perturbing sources for the asteroid? Probably Jupiter, right? Jupiter is the bigger one. So Mars is present, but that won't be nearly as important. Okay. So let's have a look at some asteroids really quick. Um, we're going to apply some of our knowledge. Um, sorry, sorry, but this is not okay. um, If you take all of the asteroids and you have them all up, this is how much matter you get. Is that big or small? Small. Anyone have a sense of how big that is? Yeah. 40,000 times smaller than the Earth. Yeah. Sorry, what is G? I forgot. Oh, yeah. Grams. Oh, that's what there's an M. You can find, um, yeah, I guess you do G, normal G, but I'm trying to distinguish it from. Sorry, okay. Um, how many are there? Well, there are 200,000 with a diameter greater than a kilometer. Um, the mass range goes to as large as 10 to the 24th and as small as 10 to the 14th. So this is real, real small. 
diameter range gets as large as a thousand kilometers and smaller than one. Densities could be very big. What is seven grams per cubic centimeter getting at? Metallic. What is 0.5? Icy or even less, right? How do you get less dense than ice? What could be possibly be made of your rock, right? Yeah, sounds like a question, but it's important. You might like scratch off the houses and take a rock. What's that called? No. Pumice. The pumice stone has a bunch of holes in it. It's very porous. So it weighs less than a normal stone at the same size. If you have a rock, it's got a bunch of holes in the interior. Its density will appear less than ice. Because nothing in a hole weighs nothing. And yet the size is quite large. There's all these holes inside it. So in fact, many asteroids are what we call rubble piles, just like a shit ton of rocks that are roughly boundly like glued together, but not held together by anything. There's all these giant pockets of air. There's no air. Nothing. Fuck with nothing. So you can get the density down. Okay. Um, here's where they live. Um, do you know what the major axis of Mars is? About 1.46, 1.5 is consistent on my answer. Here, these go between uh, just the exterior of Mars and they're close to Jupiter. They can be kind of inclined. So if this is the um, orbital plane of the rest of the planets, they can be up to 30 degrees, which is about that. Right? You want to be 30 degrees degrees? Naturally? Yeah. Oh, oh no. You're doing a hand <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what's that? Six. And you, what's that? 45. What's that? There you go. <laughs> now you learn. It's a pretty easy to trick, right? Okay. And uh, simple separation how close are they to one another? Not <laughs> Star Wars lied to you. You don't have to dodge asteroids in the asteroid belt. There's nothing fucking out there. Ten to the seven kilometers between them. Okay. All right. And just behind, I think this goes away. Yeah. So here's the big boy. Um, the way that these are all named and numbered is they are numbered in order. So Vesta was the fourth. Discovered. Um, series is not shown. Series is obviously right. Um, series, I think, is one. That's Vesta. Um, you know, if we just put on our thinking caps again, we can see that the thing one is circular, right? But, um, but it has impact cratering on it, right? So it retains whatever historical geological information um, occurred to it. Like saying, wow, that's not really a great photo. Sorry, I never come. <laughs> um, this one's a better photo. That's 21 Lutetia. These are all two scale, by the way. And you notice even right away that once you get to 21, it's on the circuit. Circular is very unusual. They're not large enough to be compressed by gravity. You get down to here, you get stuff like Eros, Gaspra, and these are just the kind of thoughts. This is 25,143rd, and that's height is how long. And if you work long enough in planetary science, they reward you by naming some unpicked asteroid with a really long number for you. 
You can go online, you can find out if there's one. We have a number, but it's called Detail Your Money. <laughs> okay. What is that one called? Oh, yeah, you can't see it, huh? Yeah, and that's it. It's got a moon. <laughs> Very good question. So we found, of course, 243 Ida first. And then this one is the first moon of Ida. And it's called that. <laughs> Very good question. And the way that we do these types of observations, they can vary a lot. Probably we need to tell you a lot more about the types of research they do. But for example, if you have some object, most of the time, you're just getting brightness, unless you go and you get really close to it. And the, re the only reason you can tell what shape it is is because it's tumbling. And so based on the fact that you know it's tumbling like this, and maybe there's like one piece that's you think like a line between, right? Sometimes you see more of the line between from these to less. They can build what's called a shape model, something that sort of describes the shape that it was assumed to be one color. And that gives you an idea of what it might look like. And then sometimes they'll see something going around it. And they'll be like, oh, there's a periodicity. There's brightness that doesn't match the shape model. All right. Any okay, that's as cool as we'll get with asteroids. Oh, I died. All right, uh, there's Jackal. We zoomed in. There's Ida. Uh, he was a scientist. He went there, saw these things with Galileo, but Galileo flew by. And um, you can see some other ones here. This is Deep Space One, Stardust, Rosetta. These are all different names of spacecraft that when we visited. This is the Mir spacecraft that went to Eros. Um, Hayabusa went to Aitokawa, this is the little tiny, tiny one. Um, these are, of course, all to scale as well. There's Lucicia even closer, gorgeous, right? That's from the Rosetta mission. Um, and then over here, this little group, these are all comets. Um, and you'll notice one thing right away is they kind of look different. They're made of obviously different stuff, but even they they don't have the same type of shape. They look like uh, at least these three that I'm showing you, they look like two little smushes smushed together, as opposed to like one giant. Right. And uh, I don't think we'll have time to get into it in this class, but this is due to the orbits evolving. And then there are two objects that start far enough away and they become contact binary. Okay. Questions about any of this? Comments, of course, are all much smaller. They're not big. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not only terrifying, like if there was, but we also have to remember that every time a comet comes into the inner solar system, it it's up and loses material. So shrinking up. All the big stuff is moved on, right? All the big stuff, like if something like this hits Mars, for example, right? You get a huge crater, like Hellas crater. So that all the big shit has gotten into the planet's room. <laughs> Right. And it's just little stuff like that. It's just the inner color. Um, this is a Halley comet 1P, famous. Again, numbering one. <laughs> this is Halley of Halley's comet. This is the first comet that was predicted to be returned. So it's P's versus uh, 103P. It seems that it's a periodic comet that's going to come back. First periodic comet, then periodic comet. Uh, they will have built, there's a bunch of different ones. So, for example, there's like Sun Grazer or SG, depends on where you're from. Cool. Now they find lots and lots of comets, so they had to switch to tell the name them. So they're named after the year. That's like 2000, the one that we just saw. The last Tuesday or something, last Monday, it was 2024A. And then it was the name of the observatory. Uh, we visited them. Um, I just showed you a lot of this. Galileo flew by these guys. Uh, Mir flew by these ones. 
I should have taken this, but I don't. <laughs> I always forget it. <laughs> and then it just stays the same. Um, we saw from the Dawn spacecraft series. Um, which got to the Let's see if all planets are like that. Yeah, I mean, it's an asteroid, but all asteroids are dwarf planets. So, in fact, it's called the Minor Planet Database. You know, we don't use the word dwarf in the community. So, there's either major planets or minor planets. And if you have not cleared out, the place that you live, you are a minor planet. So you go to the minor planet, Ceres is a minor planet, but also Dactyl is a minor planet. <laughs> which, I mean, well, I guess that's a new world. But Ida is a minor planet. And when you go and you look up the citation, that's one that has my asteroid name, it's a minor planet. <laughs> but you don't say that. Okay. <laughs> like, how much did you pay for that? <laughs> Good. All right, here's the asteroid belt. This is a snapshot. Um, walk you through this picture a little bit. Here's Jupiter. Um, this is like a picture. Um, all of these are simulated in the Earth. There's Mars, um, Venus, Mercury, Sun, not to scale. None of this is to scale except for the location of the dots. All the dots actually represent an individual asteroid. And we have many groups. There's your main belt right here. You have the Hilda's here, and the Greeks, and the Trojans. Which resonance are the Trojan? They're all out here. I do see some green moon in here. It's a little suspicious, but let me go ahead and make that. Okay. Uh, I mean, that looks crazy, right? That looks complicated. You see any gaps? Where's the gaps? There's the true one resonance. You see that free one resonance? Let's have a look here. Here's the number of asteroids. We just take this image, the clock distance to the sun. Any gaps? What? Like here? Yeah. <laughs> that does really count, right? Yeah, so let's remember this is Mars, right? Mars is one, two, three, four, and a little bit. This is Mars. Really starts like way out here. That's that count? So Mars is like right here, a bunch of shit, no gaps, right? So everything I just said is a lie, right? One wants to read fun. It's fine. Is this the right way to look at it? So long way to look. Oh, fair enough. I don't care about where they are. Like one snapshot. No. Who cares? 
pervasion. Yeah, but I mean, I can, I can see where everything is, right? Like, it shouldn't be great. Excuse me. And then you have to like evolve it, right? You have to like watch all this. I just want to look at a snapshot. And I'm wondering what whether this information I'm getting from the snapshot is helpful. There's other information I should be considering for me from the resume. Yeah, that's what I was If you are maybe considering or thinking about perturbations for systems, do I care about the instantaneous position of them? What does it mean motion rather between them? Okay, cool. Well, what is the resonance part then? Back and let's look at the definition. So this is what we discussed. We talked about the, the mean motion is the average angular velocity, just like Shear said. But now we're saying something like this. What does that statement mean? I don't see a causal relationship written there, but I do hear those words in the right one. All this says is the definition of a resonance is when the period of one body is an integer multiple of the other. Right? Do I care where the bodies are at any given moment? No, not according to that picture that I drew with your right. So should I plot where they are instantaneously? No. What should I plot instead? The periods, right? Okay. All right. Now we don't have the periods that are really stupid to interpret, but it's much easier to interpret.
the semi-major, right? When we measure the semi-major axis for all of them, we can plot the semi-major axis. And that will tell us where the periods are commensurate, right? Okay. So now, if I do this, I should expect to see gaps, right? If I don't see gaps, then everything's broken. Let's have a look. All right, there it is, right? There's the distance from the sun. You see. And that is how you look at it in the major axis. Okay, what do you see? What? Yeah, resonances, right? Look at that. No fucking asteroids will live here. Definitely not that one. Definitely not this one. Definitely not that one. And you can kind of even see they can even go up here. So you got a whole bunch of structure that you couldn't see in that other picture. So here people talk about the inner gaps, or sorry, the inner um, asteroid belts, the middle asteroid belts, and the outer asteroid belts. What? Yeah, pristine is like this group that just hasn't been messed with. They're just leftovers. Yeah, they're all down here. And the side belts. You have this high inclination population. I can tell you what's going to be. Okay. Um, and this doesn't matter whether it's above or below the ecliptic. You can do this on the moon that has perfect distance. Um, sign of the measure of the inclination. And this, of course, doesn't care about centricity at all. You just care about this in a major axis. Right? Okay. So let's say you are from the outer, outer asteroid belt. So you start to move by something. So you move your way out to the true one. What happens? When you say full, you have to go back a couple classes and think about, right? Let's take our orbit and imagine applying a force at a certain location, say a radial force. Okay, so as I get close, then you can go back and you can look at the notes. The notes have it. Okay. Let's say I have this nice, beautiful elliptic orbit. Okay, this is the sun. I'm an asteroid. That's your Jupiter. What happens if I get pulled here? Like that. What is that? What is my future? Maybe we'll be in there. We'll need that when we do pop constraints. Pop constraints will come next while you're between planets. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um particles that are knocked into the moon motion resonance, they increase in concentricity. And then they cross the orbit of a planet. At that, <laughs> what happens when you cross the orbit of a planet? You might hit the planet, right? <laughs> so that's how you get the moon with all those asteroids that smashed into its surface, right? Okay. So that's presence in a particular planet. No, no, each of those residents up there, these are all of you. Yeah, so I mean, does. Does the two one have a higher likelihood of hitting Mars or Earth? Oh no no. Okay, so one of the things that I, I'll just clarify here: hitting us is very unlikely. The most likely thing that happens is you get too close and you get a gravity assist, and it flings you out of the solar system permanently. <laughs> you do get hit, 
you know, with plenty of evidence for hits. But I think the number of asteroids that have been flung out, I forget what the number is, it's like 70 here. It's much more likely to fling an asteroid back. Even into the outer solar system, right? You just fling it out into the or something, right? Um, the number of particles is very small in those mean motion organisms, and they even have a name. You know, are familiar with this brand of vodka or iron in Costco? Earthwood? No? It's Kirkland. Yeah. But it's still fun. <laughs> Costco brand gaps. <laughs> you got to keep you engaged by making you laugh. There's all these studies that show if you're laughing in class, you're understanding them. Okay, here's the residences. These are Kirk Kirkwood gaps. Um, when we do it by centimeter axis and by number of asteroids. So the other one was sine i, the inclination. But this is much easier to see the gaps, right? This is the total number. Here is the 2 1 resonance. It is Jupiter. What's this, by the way? Yeah. 30 degrees, right? That's the 1 1 resonance. So there's nothing here. And even in this little like forest, right, that um, it's on both sides of the pristines, you have the 7 3 and the 5 2 that we just saw, very few objects, right? Whereas here, in between say 3 1 and 5 2, you have a lot of objects and it's scattered around. You have this giant chasm right in the middle of 3 1. 4 1, you even have a little. <laughs> there's Mars and there's Earth. Are these the near Earth asteroids that you've heard talk about? We're trying to protect the planet from? No. They are the closest to Earth, right? What? Yeah, so when we hear the word near Earth asteroid, this is an asteroid whose eccentricity allows it to intersect with the Earth's. Right? So what I haven't shown you here is eccentricity. So I can very well have one of these be a near-Earth asteroid because it's eccentric. Right? So just because it's A is out here doesn't mean it spends all its time out there. And remember we said one minus E is the perihelion distance. What if it's perihelion? Is Earth's orbit, right? Okay. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> um, some locations um, protect uh, protection against scattering. So, for example, um, imagine you result in an orbit that's just like Jupiter's, but placed on the opposite side of the sun. Okay. This is like that. Uh, and this is for hypothesis that we've been talking about. Yeah. So you can have an uh, Earth on the opposite side of the Earth. And since the sun's always in the way, you'll never see it. The Jupiter, and we know that this isn't quite true, but there are Hildas. Hildas live basically on the other side of Jupiter. I mean, just stay away. I'm like, whatever, bro, stay over there. We'll do our life, right? Um, the the, the um, Trojan and the Greeks are not quite examples of this. Um, they say away from Jupiter, but they're not on the other side. They're, they follow and they, they trail. They say far enough away that they're sort of being like pushed, so to speak. And we'll talk about why that is. I think what I'm going to say down right there. Are they kind of centered around the Milky Way? Yeah, yeah, those are all of them. Okay. There they are. There's your Hildas, the three, two, and the Trojan. Right. Now we can watch this again. Um, here I'm going to show you the asteroids that are in a 1 1 resonance with the Earth. So this is the Earth in blue. Here's your 1 1s. Okay. Notice anything? Yeah, they kind of clump and move around. There's a red one that's thrown in there for you to keep your eye on. Keep both of 
these bumps. Watch it go around. It looks like it has its own orbit inside it, right? It doesn't, but it looks like it, right? It's performing something called a tadpole orbit. So we'll talk about horseshoe orbits and we'll talk about tadpole orbits. Um, we won't do it yet, but what you're seeing is real. And so the tadpole orbit does this, right? Now it doesn't actually do that, it is still going around, but it appears to do that. And similarly, a horseshoe orbit is a tadpole orbit, right? So it this and this, and it finally gets long enough that it can go to the other side. And this is a horseshoe orbit. So you can go back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, the whole because the whole thing's rotating. So they are going around. But this is only the perspective of this guy that it looks like he's doing this. Right? So if I when he's standing on Earth, this red dot. Doesn't look, it just looks like it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? That's why we call it a tadpole orbit. Whereas the horseshoe orbit, from our perspective, looks like it does this, it does that. But of course, what you just saw is they're all going around, right? They're all appearing to, right? And so let me show you an exa example of this. We'll watch it again and hopefully you can see it. All right, everyone's going around. No, they're not going around. So it's still the important thing here in the sun. But if you follow that red guy, you can see those tadpole orbits. Going in the front of the path, and the back, back of the path, right? It's kind of crazy. Okay, and let me show you now how this happens before we um, end for today. So here's an example of a horseshoe orbit. And I told you about the F. We're, we're at Saturn. I just looked at this moon system. Maybe, maybe you can pick this one, maybe it's a different um, moon system, but you can meet Epimetheus and Janus. This is one of my favorite moon systems in the solar system, and it participates in uh, a really unusual dance with its partner. So this is Janus. Uh, <laughs> Janus does this, goes around in a little circle, and Epimetheus goes around in a different circle in the opposite direction. So what I mean by that is, so the amount of time that it'll take to do this will be the same time that it'll take to do that. So it'll go like this. They'll swap. One will go exterior and one will go interior. And then they'll go around and swap. And then one will go exterior and one will go interior. So Janus and Prometheus keep switching location relative to Saturn. One is closer and then one's farther. One is closer and then one's farther. And this is your question. That's the question. That's exactly. So you can only see this, obviously, as a three-body problem, right? I guess it's Saturn, Prometheus, Janus, and Saturn, you mean three bodies. And we'll talk about what this is here. This is a contour of a conserved quantity that we can only describe once we start rotating the system. Okay. Uh, I have time for one more thing here. Here's another example of the Epimetheus system. Um, and then I think we'll just take a See if this works. You better work. Excuse me. Here we go. Got it close <laughs> and started so moving faster. So, that's how here you have it's moving faster, right? And as it catches up, it's going to catch up, but it's going to pull it to a slower orbit, right? Watch what happens. Catching up, catching up, it's catching up, it's catching up, it's catching up, and it pulls it outside to a slower orbit. And now he's going to go faster, 
and he's going to catch up, and as he catches up, he's going to pull him into a fast road. But in this rotating frame, where we keep this one and this one the same, it looks like he dances back and forth around it. Weird. It's awesome. You looked it. It's so cool. What were the lights? Well, I think it's weird because isn't that also a way of saying they're not exchanging energies, but they're connected. I would think that they would bring each other up. Yeah, so they absolutely are exchanging energies. And one thing that this simulation is not showing you is the motion of the parent body. Right? So they have to exchange angular momentum, right, in order to move closer or farther, right? This is a three-body problem. But unfortunately, in a two-body problem, you have conserved quantity. And one of the issues is that in a three-body problem, don't. It's fucked. Okay? Everything gets horrible. And you can't conserve quantities in it. Because you have all of these additional problems. And we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Comments, questions, concerns? Have your homework, or I'm getting your homework? Oh my God. Uh, I have a 